Good evening, distinguished delegates, faculty advisors, members of the board of the National Collegiate College Conference Association, volunteer staff, honored guests, and friends. It is an extraordinary pleasure to welcome you here this evening. I am also incredibly honored to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Samantha Power, United States Re Permanent Representative to the United Nations. At the United Nations, Ambassador Power works to advance U.S. interests, promote and defend universal values, and address pressing global challenges to global peace, security, and prosperity. Prior to serving as U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Power served as a Special Assistant to President Obama and Senior Director for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights on the National Security Staff at the White House. In this role, she focused on issues including UN reform, LGBT and women's rights, the promotion of religious freedom, and the protection of religious minorities, human trafficking, and democracy and human rights. Before joining the U.S. government, Ambassador Power was a professor at the John F. Kennedy of School of Government, teaching courses on U.S. foreign policy, human rights, and U.N. reform. She was also the founding executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, at Harvard, also at Harvard University. Ambassador Power began her career as a journalist and is also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Ambassador Power came to the United States at the age of nine from Ireland and went on to earn a BA from Yale University and a JD from Harvard Law School. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Samantha Power. Thanks. It's great to be here. What a crowd. I just got here, but it looks like nerd heaven. <laughs> Am I right? Nerd paradise. I belong here. It's perfect. Uh, it feels more like a rock concert than a place for serious speeches. Uh, so in that sense, it has a different feel than the United Nations. Congratulations. Uh, but Model UN attracts young people who enjoy the rhythm and music of world affairs. And I can tell you from experience that at the real UN, although we do hit some pretty discordant notes along the way, harmony is our goal. That's our real goal. This evening I want to congratulate each of you for being here as a representative of your country or your school. And I hope you'll learn a great deal in the days ahead about how the UN operates, about its strengths, its capabilities, and also a little bit about your own country. In my remarks, I'll touch upon events at the UN, both on the economic and social side and on questions of war and peace. Before I do, I'd like to briefly share with you some of the experiences that shaped my own view of the world. I am, as my fellow uh, once fellow Irish person uh, has described, uh, I am an immigrant. Uh, I came to America from Ireland when I was nine years old. And uh, when I was your age, I was much more interested in sports than in world affairs. I'm only a little bit ashamed to say. I'm actually the greatest testament to how much respect I have for all of you is that I'm not home watching uh, the NCAA March Madness. Uh, <laughs> right now, the last game, settling the last entry to the Final Four. Uh, so I still have some of that affliction. Um, but I have gotten a little more serious uh, in my old age. I found new heroes as I got older, people around the globe who were standing up to dictators and promoting freedom and peace. Uh, one of the most memorable uh, images sort of seared in my psyche uh, is that of a man standing up to a tank in Tiananmen Square in 1989 when I was uh, in college uh, hosting a nightly sports show on the radio station. But that image of that man, it was a new kind of hero, somebody willing to put it all on the line uh, for the cause of democracy and freedom. This led me, this evolution over time, led me to begin my career as a freelance journalist 
where I got a close-up look at the suffering that war could cause. I traveled to Bosnia in Southeast Europe, a place where the members of one ethnic group were trying to dominate others, and in the process where many innocent men, women, and children were killed. I wrote stories that I hoped might prompt someone who has my current job uh, and others like that person um, to do something to stop the bloodshed. But that didn't happen until tens of thousands of people had been killed and more than two million people had become homeless. I was deeply saddened by the, world's community, the world community's failure to prevent the slaughter. When I returned to America, I went to law school. I helped to establish a human rights center. I wrote a book about genocide and then uh, a young, newly elected senator uh, called me up having read the book that I'd written on genocide uh, and wanting to discuss it, and his name was Barack Obama. That changed things <laughs> in a hurry. One thing led to another, and in 2009, I began serving in the White House on issues related to democracy and human rights, to UN reform, and a whole host of other topics. Just last summer, the president named me uh, to serve as America's ambassador to the United Nations. So now I get to wake up in the morning and go to the Security Council, where you all will be role playing, I'm sure, um, and I get to sit behind the placard that says United States of America, which is an amazing thing for an Irish immigrant to get to do and a testament uh, to, I think, one of the many extraordinary features of, of this country and uh, the limitless possibilities we all have um, here. I also have the chance, even bigger privilege, which is to try to uh, address the challenges that so many of us care deeply about. Uh, I have the privilege of actually being able to try to, to do something about those things along with people in my government and people representing countries from, from all around the world. It's a complex job, but uh, it's my dream job, I love it. And my overriding message to you uh, today is to have faith that you too will be able to live out your dreams, not just in Model UN, where I know some of your dreams have lodged. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, but, but, uh, but in the real thing, in the real world, right? You're, you're role playing with the aim of doing this uh, someday for real. Uh, to really try to bring peace, to promote human rights, uh, to establish security, human security uh, for people around the world. That's why, that's why you're here, and I know that's where many of your dreams have, have taken you. And I'm confident that in this room, but not just in this room, also over there in the overflow room, for the slackers who didn't get here on time, <laughs> that there are, uh, who I'm gonna go see in a minute, uh, there are future presidents, there are future prime ministers, uh, there may well be a future secretary general. Um, there are just as importantly future journalists who are gonna hold accountable people like me in government uh, and future secretaries uh, general, hold all of us accountable uh, who are in officialdom. There are future civil society leaders who are the engine of democratic change around the world and uh, all of you in committing yourselves to peace and to human rights and, and to the causes that you're here to promote, um, of course, are just going to be great citizens no matter where you land up and no matter what your line of work, and that's incredibly important. Don't let anyone tell you uh, that you can't do what you want, uh, and don't let anybody tell you that you can't make a difference, uh, because you can. Uh, especially if you understand the need to combine your strengths with those of others on behalf of causes that matter. And I think one of the amazing things about today and this gathering is just you can feel the power in the room. Uh, if you all put your, your minds to the same cause, uh, the, the impact you can make, even at your age now, uh, can be tremendous. As many of you know, the UN decided to test this concept that if you band together, uh, you can make a difference. Uh, in many, has tried to test it in many ways. Uh, it did so in particular 14 years ago when the countries of the UN came together and they blessed uh, these targets called the Millennium Development Goals. 
and many of you are, are uh, nodding, you know what the Millennium Development Goals are. They are benchmarks uh, for human progress. Human progress on poverty, education, health, the environment, women's empowerment, a whole host of goals that of course we share have always been part of the UN uh, culture and always a part of human aspirations. But suddenly when the goals came along, it became a little more concrete. Uh, the countries of the world decided to measure uh, how, how they were doing as against a set of benchmarks. And this wasn't just a symbolic exercise. It turns out these goals have proven quite sticky. And we have made progress since the year 2000 uh, in a whole host of ways, trying to, again, move toward these very specific numerical tar targets. The UN and its partners in the last quarter century have helped to reduce the rate of extreme poverty by 60% and cut in half both the number of women who die during childbirth and the number of children who perish before the age of five. That's major. And, and again, you've seen steep returns as people have focused themselves around these very specific targets. Globally, tuberculosis treatments have saved 20 million people since 1995. Deaths from malaria have dropped 25% since 2000. And the share of infants born with the HIV virus has declined by 50% since 2006. By 50%. And there's now a real uh, within reach goal of having that number drop all the way down uh, to zero. Such gains are important in their own right, but they also enhance our ability to prevent and contain conflict because although there are many causes of fighting, desperation is among them. So the economic and the social UN agenda link inexorably to the challenge of promoting and enforcing international peace and security. The UN's best known purpose is, of course, uh, promoting international stability, a task described by the former Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld in the following way. The UN was not created to take mankind to heaven, he said, but to save humanity from hell. Here, the organization's record is mixed. Since the UN's founding, we have avoided the catastrophe of a third global war but we have also witnessed no fewer than 150 international and civil conflicts of varying duration and size. And I know all of you are familiar with our docket at present, which includes a whole host of devastating uh, crises around the world. The horrific bloodshed in Syria, a war that has now lasted three years and caused untold suffering ethnic cleansing, chilling ethnic cleansing in a country called the Central African Republic uh, that is newly uh, getting the attention that it, that it warrants because of the targeting of Muslims and Christians in what has become, uh, become a conflict that has taken on horrific religious connotations. In South Sudan, a country that had such promise that has only recently achieved independent status, now an ethnic conflict inside the country, pitting one group against another of course, the targeted killing of civilians that we've seen in the country of Sudan uh, for too long, including in Darfur. Um, and just when you thought the docket couldn't burst at the seams, uh, among other crises that I won't even uh, mention here today, you have Russia's uh, illegal uh, occupation and takeover of Crimea, Ukraine. So that's, that's the kind of, those are the kinds of issues uh, that we need you all uh, to sharpen your skills, to hone those skills, uh, and to engage as you go forward in your lives in trying to help. Help cover if you become a journalist, help provide humanitarian assistance if you become an aid worker, or help the cause of peace uh, if you become a diplomat. Trying to stop the world's bleeding is a task that is both, I think, underestimated and underappreciated. And it is something that the UN as an organization tries to do every day. When violence breaks out and civilians are killed in a place that the UN is present, the organization, the UN, is often blamed whether or not it has been given the resources required to do the job. And the dangers to those who serve the UN in harm's way are great over the years more than 3,000 peacekeepers have been killed while trying to enforce international peace and security. 
the reason that UN peacekeepers are often at risk is because they represent the opposite of what extremists and terrorists want. Instead of division, they try to bring opposing factions together. Instead of sowing desperation, they work with relief agencies to bring food and medicine to people in need. Instead of endorsing the theory that might makes right, they foster the development of democratic political institutions. And remember that UN missions are not made up of people defending the safety and security of their own countrymen, of their own people. They are leaving their families, their children, their homes, and going far away, often to places that they've never even thought about visiting in order to make sacrifices on behalf of other people's children and other people's families. The role of governments is vital in responding to national and international challenges. But as you may already have learned from the student organizations in which you participate, you don't have to be a government official to care, to dream, or to act. All around the world, good people are coming together every day, often across ethnic, religious, and racial lines. Their focus may be as narrow as the creation of a food cooperative in a single village, or as broad uh, as focusing on the global promotion of democracy. They may be driven by a shared concern for the environment or by a determination to eliminate hate speech, to curb corruption, or to advance human rights, LGBT rights, women's rights, children's rights, you name it. The growth of civil society and the increase in its capabilities are good news to those of us who believe in the value of grassroots organization. The bad news is that a lot of governments are very uncomfortable with this kind of activism. And one of the things I want to draw your attention to while I have your attention um, is a phenomenon that has uh, taken root over the last decade, but particularly in the last four or five years, which is a global crackdown on civil society. For every new social media follower that an NGO may have, you have a government official in, in one country or another getting very, very nervous, getting incrementally more nervous, and that is having its effect. You are seeing uh, regimes trying to crack down on civil society by trying to silence social media and by imposing a wide array of new restrictions on the media, but also even on the power and the freedom to gather on an occasion like this one or even to gather in smaller groups. Dozens of laws have come into existence just in the last four or five years uh, in which the rule of law, which the UN and many of our governments have sought to promote, is being replaced by the rule by law, where you have Russia and Zimbabwe and the laws that they have put in place to crack down on civil society being mimicked by even democracies around the world who are concerned that the force of a gathering like this one, the force of the collective will and spirit and aspirations of their people is dangerous. So instead of sharing best practices, which is something the UN has sought to do uh, as countries go through different stages of development, economic, agricultural, you name it, even in military training and so forth, instead of best practices being shared, you're actually seeing governments come together to share worst practices about how they can successfully crack down on civil society and, and prevent networks like this one from taking root. We have to fight against this crackdown because a healthy and flourishing civil society is essential to the kind of future we want. And because progress of any kind is not possible without a free and open exchange of ideas. And you're already part of civil society. So I hope you can take up this cause and look into this challenge that is, is a new phenomenon. Again, a counter reaction to the very success of the movements uh, that have taken form uh, in recent years. A major part of my work at the UN is to listen. And given that the UN has so many members and so many talkers, I have the chance to listen a lot. Uh, we have many arguments, but what I wanna leave you with is what strikes me most in the time that I have been in my job, which is how deeply most of us want exactly the same things. As nations and as individuals, we insist on being treated by, with dignity. We don't always expect to get our way, 
but we do want our voices to be heard. We ask that our history and our culture be respected, and in return, we are willing to respect the history and culture of others. We have a ton of disagreements, but in those core areas of agreement, we should be able to find common ground, and that is what we have to work to achieve every day. We are determined to create a future with less ignorance and more understanding, less suffering and more justice, less cruelty and more kindness, less fear and more hope, less war and more peace, fewer discordant notes and more harmony. And I will finish where I started by saying that looking out at all of you, uh, knowing that you understand that it's not enough to simply have your ideals, you have to acquire the knowledge and the skills to boot. That's one of the reasons you're here, to become better at pursuing the objectives that you have. But looking out at all of you, I wish you could be standing where I'm standing or sitting where these people are sitting. It's inspiring. And you have the power collectively, along with the people in the overflow room, uh, to change the world. <laughs> so some say that all this harmony talk is too much to expect in a troubled world. Uh, I say it's an agenda we can all get behind, uh, and it is my job, yes, I'm privileged to say it is my job to help try to bring it about, uh, but it is also your job already. And so please take that job seriously. We really need you, and I thank you for letting me share the opening of what's gonna be a remarkable few days for all of you. Thank you so much.